here are the top 10 directors of all times. Now, there's some that got left off. I started going through the list. There's multiple that, you know, deserve an honorable mention, of course. You know, you got your Stanley Kubricks, you got your Eli Kazans, you got your James Camerons, your Howard Hawks, your Orson Welles, your Woody Allens, um, your William Wylers, your Frank Capra, David Lean, and Richard Donner would be the three that I would I would throw out there. Um, they didn't make my list, but they're, you know, they're certainly in the top 20, of course. Um, and you know, they they deserve a mention, but I'm going to start right off at 10. I'm Fox Sellers, and if this is your type of thing, please click like and subscribe so that you can hear and see more of my videos. Number 10, John Huston. A film like Misfits, he's got Clark Gable, he's got Montgomery Clift, he's got Eli Wallach, he's got Marilyn Monroe in her last film, Clark Gable's last film. They, they produced together some of the best performances I've seen in any of his movies. It, and it's, it's a highlight of his career in a lot of ways. crazy they're all crazy john houston's an example of somebody who was a renaissance man he was really good at almost everything he did a lot of people don't realize that he was he was a painter spent a lot of time in paris painting uh was a hunter one of the best things about his movies especially from the point of view of the studio was he was extremely well prepared so he showed up with a movie and it was already done in his head so he was economical and efficient with the way he produced it one example of this is John Huston was so adamant that nobody tinker with his movies or his film or the edit that he filmed it in a way that only, only what he filmed could be used in the final product. So it was so efficient and so limited in what the editor could do that like that was it. Like here's the movie I made. He selected actors that were the best in the industry. He, you know, he had Humphrey Bogart, he had Gregory Peck, he had Deborah Kerr. I mean, you name it. He had the perfect person for every one of these films. Baby, you're going to pieces, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, they, they are tearing me to pieces. I was just hanging on to like a get here to the, to the hammock on the veranda over the rainforest and the, and, and the Stillwater Beach. That's all that can pull me through. Honey, you just lie down in the hammock and I'll fix you a nice rum cocoa. No, no, no. If I start drinking rum cocos now, I'll never stop drinking rum cocos. Reverend! They want us to go back into town! Well, tell them they can't go back into town! Night of the Iguana is a perfect example of that because he's got Richard Burton, he's got Deborah Kerr, he's got Ava Gardner, and they all put together such a performance. Uh, you know, Richard Burton puts it all together and he kind of ties it, and, but he he's emotionally unbound in it like he's unhinged in so many of his scenes one of my favorites is Moby Dick Moby Dick if you read it is it's like fine wine but if you watch this movie it's like the same you're drinking from the same bottle of wine he captured the essence of the book and the poetry of it like it's one of those movies where I can put it on and watch just you know chunks of it and it holds up like poetry whosoever of ye finds me that white whale Ye shall have this Spanish gold ounce, my boy. It's a right whale, I say. And then also uh, Gregory Peck as Captain Ahab is just, he, he just dominates the screen. Just his voice in it, his, his presence really holds up. I mean, it's a piece, it's a masterpiece on so many levels. And then you got my favorite movie, which is Treasure of the Sierra Madre. And it's got his father in it. His father actually wins an Academy Award for Best Actor. And his performance is just 
awe-inspiring. My, 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 what great prospectors. Two shoe clerks reading the magazine about prospecting for gold in the land in the midnight sun, south of the border or west of the Rockies. <laughs> Shut your trap. Shut up, Ross. Smash your head flat. Go ahead. Go ahead. Throw it if you can never leave this wilderness alive. Without me, you two The way he ridicules both Tim Holt and um, Humphrey Bogart in that in this one scene is hilarious. Two fine bedfellows. You're so dumb. There's nothing to compare you with. You're dumber than the dumbest jackass. Look at each other, will you? Do you ever see anything like yourself for being dumb specimens? <laughs> You're so dumb. You don't even see the riches you're treading on with your own feet. <laughs> This is one of those movies, if, you, if you've never seen The Treasure of the Sierra Madre, you have to see this movie. Number nine, Clint Eastwood. Clint is one of the less flashier directors on this list. Watch it, Abe. He's meaner than a rattler and twice as fast with them pistols. You're a bush hog, ain't you, Mr. Josie Wales? Much like John Huston, he's economical, he's steeped in preparedness, his devotion to a well-scripted story. He's ready the day it's time to shoot. And his actors are certainly well-selected, just like John Huston. He's also notable for, he, he did a biopic of John Huston called uh, White Hunter Black Heart. The movie Outlaw Josie Wales has this famous line in it, Diane ain't much of a living. It touches on this anti-war theme throughout which is very similar to All Quiet on the Western Front, the German story of World War I, and then also very similar to the Vietnam War movie uh, First Blood with John Rambo, who comes back with severe PSTD. But it follows and portrays the, this weathered Civil War vet in a time of lawlessness. At least we have time to bear them, fellas. The hell with them, fellas. Buzzards gotta eat, same as worms. Pale Rider is this movie that, that it always seemed to me as a remake of the movie Shane with Alan Ladd in it. It follows the old mythical motif of the mysterious traveler who arrives to protect a small defenseless town from, from like the, the ruthless mining company, as it were. Um, he's called the Preacher. And he has no backstory. There's like the, the, the whole thing is mysterious as to who he is and where he came from. But he's very, very dark. He's ruthless and, and he's, he's, I guess you'd call a mean gunfighter. And he goes up against this capitalistic group that, you know, wants to get everybody out of town at whatever odds. They hire mercenaries to kill, to kill the preacher and then to also kill any of the, the miners in town who won't sell out. It's another one of those movies where the end justifies the mean and it gets darker and darker as you go. I've often heard actors describe in interviews Clint's process as being fast and efficient. And when there's a scene that's, that's choreographed in a certain way and it doesn't go exactly as planned, he's famously always said, well, that's what happened. He doesn't want to film another scene. He just wants to stick to the realism of like, well, we meant for this to happen, but that's what happened. Fine. Just go with it. He said my daughter in there. He said my daughter in there. No. 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 It's just another example of him being efficient and economical, just like John Huston. Circle. And we're bound to come across somebody who's seen these then there's Unforgiven. Unforgiven is, is one of those westerns that came at a time when westerns were dead. Nobody's making westerns anymore in the in the 80s and 90s. And he revived it in a way that was it was undone. Like no one had, no one had done a western like this. It follows the story of of these prostitutes where this one prostitute's face was all cut up and they they all kind of pool their money together to to hire put a bounty on the men who did it and it follows the stark contrast between all of the people and their perspective on it namely the sheriff in town who follows by the letter of the law justice and then all of the bounty hunters who come to town and then all the women who want vengeance upon this man these men hold it well sir you are a cowardly 
away, son of a bitch. You just shot an unarmed man. Well, he should have armed himself. Gene Hackman plays Bill, Bill Daggett, who's the sheriff in town, and I believe he won an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor. So he did an unbelievable job. The movie won Best Picture, and in my opinion, I always felt that this, out of all of the Academy Awards Best Pictures, was the best of the Best Pictures. Number eight. Wake up! John Hughes. Who has to go to the laboratory? Tell you what, dipshit. You don't like my policies, you can just come on down here and smooch my big old white butt. Cat! Pucker up, buttercup. What? Ferris Bueller's online, too. John Hughes is definitely the funniest director on this list, and he's definitely in the top two of screenwriters on the list. You'll find that throughout any one of his movies, and his movies do stand by themselves. If you could take, he's got a smaller uh, list of movies, but of the movies, every single one of them is solid. He's got a, he's got a good, like five or six, just really, really solid movies. And you'll notice littered throughout is just funny line after funny line after funny line. I don't know what the hell you're talking about, Lucy, and I want you to shut up. Does Barry Manilow know that you raid his wardrobe? I'll give you the answer to that question, Mr. Bender, next Saturday. Don't mess with the bull, young man. You'll get the horns. <sighs> Feeling kind of queasy? How about a nice... Greasy pork sandwich served in a dirty ashtray. Will milk be made available to us? We're extremely thirsty, sir. I have a really low tolerance for dehydration. I've seen her dehydrate, sir. It's pretty gross. His films relate to teens and show how teens deal with the things they have to deal with while growing up. Yet, at the same time, it's grounded in in a way that mature audiences can appreciate it. So it doesn't insult your intelligence by any means. What? You're going the wrong way! He says we're going the wrong way. Oh, he's drunk. How would he know where we're going? Yeah, how would he know? Thank you. Thanks a lot. Terrific. Thank you. <laughs> what a moron. They're all goofy, they're all fun, and you can appreciate every scenes. Even you know, like they're very serious in the way they're done. It's just he has a lighthearted way of showing you how everyone grew up. Number seven, Billy Wilder. Now, Billy Wilder, he actually just showed up on Vulture Magazine's list of the 100 greatest screenwriters of all times. He's number one on their list, which I agree 100%. He won Best Picture, he's won two Best Directors, he's won three Best Screenplays, and he was nominated 21 times. Look at that! Look how she moves! That's just like Jello on springs. Must have some sort of built-in motor or something. His films range from some of the best dramas to some of the best thrillers, to some of the best comedies, and like really some of the best comedies that are out there. Double Indemnity, Reinvented, and some say legitimized film noir. Wait till I put something on, I'll be right down. Nettie, show Mr. Neff into the living room. Where would the living room be? In there, but they keep the liquor locked up. It's all right, I'll just carry my own keys. Then there's the movie Some Like It Hot, which was groundbreaking in its subject matter. It, it follows these, these two guys who dress up as women so that they can get into a female band so that they can hide out from the mob. And as you can guess, there's just all of these mistaken scenarios that occur. Osgood proposed to me. We're planning a June wedding. <laughs> what are you talking about? You can't marry Osgood. You think he's too old for me? Bosom Buddies wouldn't exist if it wasn't for Some Like It Hot. It completely robbed the whole concept of it. Three's Company, 
all of those mistaken scenarios and mistaken identities that occur in Three's Company, they, w- they wouldn't have come up with that if it wasn't for Some Like It Hot. There are two things that I will not put up with during working hours. One is liquor and the other one is men. Men? Oh, you don't have to worry about that. We wouldn't be caught dead with men. <laughs> Rough, hairy beasts with eight hands. And they they all just want one thing from a girl. You're Norma Desmond. Used to be in silent pictures. Used to be big. I am big. It's the picture that got small. Uh Well, well, gentlemen, am I interrupting something? Yeah, Schultz, we're just passing out guns. Stalag 17. That's a film that works on many, many levels. It's a comedy. It's a thriller in that, you know, it's like a, it's an escape film. They're trying to escape from a prison in World War II. And then it's also a whodunit where they're trying to figure out who is the rat that's telling on them. So it works on so many levels. Who's giving it to you? Which one of us is it? Which one of you is what? Which one of us is the informer? Are you trying to say that one American put the informer and another American? That's the general idea. Only it's not so general as far as I'm concerned. Ah, you're talking crazy. It's no use, Schultz. You might as well come clean. Why don't you just tell him it's me? Because I'm really the illegitimate son of Hitler. And after the Germans win the war, you're going to make me the gallleiter of Zinzanati. <laughs> you Americans, you are the craziest people. That's why I like you. Billy Wilder is never lazy with his writing. I'm going to take the example of The Apartment, which won Best Picture for him, as an example. Now, the movie follows this executive who has an apartment in the city. And what he does is he lends his apartment out to other executives so that he can move up the ladder and they use it so that they can cheat on their wives. It, it has comedic elements to it, but it's, it's actually a very serious uh, drama that plays out. And the example I want to use is there's this scene where he learns that the woman that he has a crush on, who's played by Shirley MacLaine, is uh, also sleeping with his boss who's cheating on his wife with her um the star bud who's played by jack lemon finds her mirror and sees that there's a crack in it and he knows from before that he's given that back to his boss because somebody left it in his apartment are you sure this is the right way to wear this i think so here you don't think it's tilted a little too much i mean after all this is a conservative firm i don't want people to think i'm an entertainer The mirror, it's broken. Yes, I know. I like it that way. Makes me look the way I feel. Now, he could very easily just play that scene out by just having him overhear this, or he could see the two of them together. But he finds this very clever way of divulging to the audience, this is who she is. Is there too much of draft? Shall I roll up the window? Just roll up your mouth. You talk too much. I'd have known how much you talked. I'd never have come out of my coma. And then there's Witness for the Protection, which in my eyes is a masterpiece. It takes a really serious story, situation related to courtroom drama and a whodunit murder. And it sprinkles comedy through dialogue by way of Charles Lawton, who plays this cranky old prosecuting attorney. And he's done very seriously and allows for it to land perfectly. Definitely one of his best films. I wanted to get out of Germany, so... You lied, did you not? Just yes or no, please. Yes. Thank you. And subsequently, in arranging the marriage, you lied to the authorities? I um, did not tell the truth to the authorities. You lied to them? Yes. And in the ceremony of marriage itself, when you swore to love and to honor and to cherish your husband, that too was a lie? Yes. And when the police questioned you about this wretched man who believed himself married and loved, you told them. I told them what Leonard wanted me to say. You told them that he was at home with you at 25 minutes past nine, and now you say that that was a lie. Yes, a lie. And when you said that he had accidentally cut his wrist, again you lied. Yes. And now today you've told us a new story entirely. The question is, Frau Helm, were you lying then? Are you lying now? Or are you not, in fact, a chronic and habitual liar? Number six, a 
Akira Kurosawa. Now, here's a director I'm, I'm actually pretty excited to talk about. Uh, Akira Kurosawa was wholly original, ahead of his time, and in a market that was limited. So, like, he came from the Japanese cinema, which was a far cry from Hollywood. And yet he transcended most of all the storytellers at his time. Let's take let's take uh, Rashomon for for example. So this is a movie. Oh, and by the way, uh, Ridley Scott just recently copied this movie with uh, the Last Duel, and it's told from the perspective of three different people. So you get three different stories. They're filmed in three different ways. He finds a way for you to question the validity of a- all three stories. Also, if you're familiar with the movie Hidden Fortress, this is one of those films where if you match it up to George Lucas's Star Wars, it's almost as if George Lucas copied it shot for shot. And and I'll, I'll post a link down in the description below where I had found that somebody had put them up against each other um, scene for scene. And there's so many scenes where it's like, oh, my God, Lucas, you love the guy or what? <laughs> He had developed a level of skill in photography that had completely ellipsed his contemporaries. He understood lighting better than anyone. It was a time of the black and white film, so his use of contrast was absolutely perfect. His composition was the highest of aesthetic artistry, if if you will. And most importantly, these are moving pictures, so his use of movement in shots is absolutely brilliant. Like it's, it's unparalleled. Like there's so many scenes where where you watch where he cuts from this scene to that scene and the way he does it back and forth and has the, the people in the scene move. It's almost like a symphony. It's almost like he's writing music, but he doesn't have anyone who to hear it. He just has all of your eyes as part of the audience in so many of his films. He copied the the old Western motif, but he did it so well that all the Western films after this copied Akira Kurosawa. Yojimbo, for example, was was copied by, I don't know if you're familiar with the Clint Eastwood movies but directed by Sergio Leon of The Man With No Name. Um, it was actually, they had asked for permission to remake the Yojimbo and Sanjuro movie into this film trilogy and they didn't get permission to do it. So they just did it anyway. Um, And there's enough of a difference where they could get away with it. But Yojimbo comes to this town and there's two sides to this village and he plays both sides just so that he can make money. And interestingly, the sequel Sanjuro has this scene in the end of it where they go to have they they have this duel and they go to slash the guy and they had rigged all of this blood to come out but it was supposed to just kind of drip out or ooze out and for whatever reason it was mistakenly blasted out and just flew out of his body and all you know all the technicians were like oh my god i guess we got to do that again and and uh, akira kurosawa was like oh no i loved it that was awesome it would never really been done in films before. And then it was copied by everybody. Everybody started putting all of these scenes in martial arts movies and samurai movies where they'd slash people and then just blood would spray everywhere. They did it in horror movies. And if you've ever seen Kill Bill, Kill Bill almost mocks it where in the, in the end of Kill Bill Volume 1, in the, in the fight scene against the Crazy Eight, there she's running around and there's just blood blasting everywhere. And it's kind of a take on that. Every great director always has their one guy that they collaborate with. And for Akira Kurosawa, it was Toshiro Mifune. Toshiro Mifune shows up in every one of Akira Kurosawa's greatest films. He's kind of like the John Wayne to John Ford or the Tom Hanks to Spielberg. You take the Yojimbo and Sinjira films, for example. He has this presence and, and Akira Kurosawa had asked him to do this shoulder shake so that all the scenes from the distance, he could see that that was 
the man with no name or, you know, Toshira Mifune. And then finally, we have his greatest film, which is Seven Samurai. And Seven Samurai is responsible for, I don't know, how many different 80s TV shows and remake movies. If you've ever heard of The Magnificent Seven, it is a exact remake of it. It's just a Western. Um, and it's done almost as well, too, by the way. Um, but you have that, you have the three amigos, and it's basically this group of mercenaries that try to help a small village who's being troubled or um, terrorized by villains. And they kind of use these primitive ways to help protect them. If you've ever seen an episode of The A-Team, every single episode of The A-Team is The Seven Samurai. And then there's his storytelling. So his creative storytelling is still copied to this day. Anyone that's ever studied Joseph Campbell and his critique of storytelling and myth, you'll know his appreciation for Kurosawa. He quotes uh, concepts from Kurosawa all the time. Kurosawa understood mankind's relationship to spirit, to tradition, cultural behavior, um, even that as it relates to the, like the character's journey. And, and, and Joseph Campbell wrote the the hero's journey based on a lot of the motifs that Akira Kurosawa was using, whether that's spiritual or existential. His influence on modern film directors and movies is is just, you, you can't compare it to anything else. I can't tell you how many times I would see an interview and I'd hear Spielberg or Lucas or Scorsese talk about him. John Melius, who, you know, great sc- screenwriter, he used to talk about him all the time. Now we're into our top five. Number five, Christopher Nolan. I thought my jokes were bad. Chris Nolan takes more of a scientific approach to his visuals and his scripts. Um, all of these are typically much more mature, uh, sophisticated, and his subject matter is a bit more complex. Nolan is very calculated in the way he approaches his films. He's, he's kind of like a modern day Stanley Kubrick. Uh, for example, I'll, I'll start with his symbols. He has symbolism in almost every one of his movies, whether it's from Memento to Prestige to the Batman series to Inception, especially. So, for example, in the Batman trilogy, in Batman Begins, he has symbols that show up throughout. Namely, the the arrowhead at the beginning of the movie, which is kind of his north star. It, it it tells you the direction that he's going. He he finds it when he discovers the Batcave, and then it's also tied to Rachel, who he gives it back and forth to. There's also the stethoscope, which is found, um, which is his father's, um, that he finds after the mansion burns. A giant sarcastic robot. What a great idea. Interstellar was his foray into quantum physics. Even though, like, for example, the the Batman trilogies and Interstellar are considered sci-fi fantasies, his approach is always one of realism. How would this have been done? How, in our realistic world, if this was a thing, what would it look like? And he's very, very conscious of that every time he approaches it. Exactly. Nolan also understands perfect pacing of revelations throughout his films. His patience in revealing very specific plot points is is absolutely perfect. Uh, Most directors will just overload you with different plot points early on um, because they want to get on with the action. And Nolan doesn't do that. There's a very specific time that's calculated for him to reveal certain things. And a lot of times it will happen in the postlude. And lastly, I want to touch on his most successful uh, collaboration, which was with Heath Ledger when he played the Joker. The Joker scenes, I mean, even when I'm putting this video together, I'm going through some of these clips and watching them and just I'm mesmerized by the way 
he manipulates everybody in the scene. He manipulates the camera. And I'm talking about Heath Ledger. I don't even talk about Christopher Nolan here. They just, they, they truly are amazing. Hi. No, I, I didn't rig those charges. Your man, your plan. Do I really look like a guy with a plan? Number four, Alfred Hitchcock. Hitchcock is one of those rare directors that has a massive catalog, but within it, there are so many really great movies. Um, you can watch pretty much any one of them, and you're going to be impressed with Hitchcock's film. Uh, he's mastered suspense, dialogue, composition, mood, uh, specifically mood. The, the tension that he creates in so many of his films is, I mean, you could cut it with a knife and you, you feel it throughout the whole film and it builds and builds and builds. No connection between them at all. Never saw each other before. Each one has somebody that he'd like to get rid of. So, they swap murders. There has been no... The Lady Vanishes is one of those great examples of character development for him, where within the movie, each one of the characters is lying about the woman that vanishes. But each one of them has a reason to be lying. So you learn this. You kind of sometimes you side with them, sometimes you don't. Um, but it it, it there, there's a subtle humor that he adds to each one of them, and the antics that occur with each one of the passengers on the on the train is extremely entertaining as it develops. He understands the impact uh, certain stories have on people's emotion. And one specifically that that he gravitated towards was Psycho. He had just finished reading the book Psycho. It was a huge hit. And he's like, I want to make that movie. I'm not even going to swat that fly. I hope they are watching. They'll see. They'll see and they'll know. And they'll say, why, she wouldn't even harm a fly. His, his interest in, in photography is relevant in so many of his movies. I mean, you'll see it in Spellbound. You'll, spe you'll see it in Rear Window. Um, and shots throughout. I mean, he developed what was later called the, the Dolly Zoom. And then also uh, it was labeled the Vertigo Effect. But that was because of it was Hitchcock. Uh, Spielberg used it. In Jaws, with that you know that one shot of Chief Brody that he comes up on, and then also they used it in Lord of the Rings many times. Lots and lots of directors have used it. Now you don't really approve of murder, Rupert. If I may, you may, and I do. Think of the problems it would solve: unemployment, poverty, standing in line for theater tickets. One film specifically, uh, The Rope, which was. You know, originally a play, and the script is really well done. I mean, every scene, the dialogue in it is fantastic. But he wanted to do it in a way that was almost like a stage where it was all one shot. And you can't do that naturally because the, the canisters of the magazines for the film would only last 10 minutes. But he found an interesting way to cut it all together so that it, you couldn't tell that it was, it was a cut. Um, even though you can tell, but you, the way it was done, it looks as if it's all one shot. Beautifully filmed. Um, and he found a way to kind of manipulate this. As great as he was at, you know, suspense and, and just framing his shots and, and whatnot and dialogue for that matter. Uh, he was actually really good at comedy. So uh, the trouble with Harry was his attempt at comedy. And it lands. It lands beautifully. I, I'm surprised he didn't have more comedic attempts. Um, this movie, and by the way, it was copied too several times, and the concept used over and over again. But the, the the story follows this dead body that's discovered by multiple members of a, of a very small New England community. And as each one of them discover the body, they feel responsible. They feel as if like they maybe are responsible for Harry's death. And some of them hide it. They want to prevent the discovery of the body by somebody else. And it has this comedic thread throughout the whole movie. Um, but it also has a lot of these scenes where they're moving a dead body. A very, very reminiscent of Weekend at Bernie's. And I tr trust me, Weekend at Bernie's is copying this movie very specifically. But it's got a lot of witty little scenes. It's also got Jerry Mathers from Leave it to Beaver in it. Uh, I, I want to say before Leave it to Beaver. So he's even younger in this. Perhaps I'll come back tomorrow. When's that? Day after today. That's yesterday. Today's tomorrow. 
It was. When was tomorrow yesterday, Mr. Morrow? Today. Oh, sure. Yesterday. You'd be just surprised to learn that Hitchcock only had one movie that won Best Picture. Um, and that's my favorite movie, which is Rebecca. Rebecca is this very haunting story that follows this this woman who's married a very wealthy widower. Um, and he he brings her to his mansion. It's it's this gothic ghost, like ghostly haunted story that's um, on a cliff on the edge of the ocean, very dark. I mean, the, the mood that he creates through this is, is palpable. The, um, the, all of the staff is still attached to this woman, Rebecca De Winters, who is the, the, the dead wife. Um, and they can't quite get over it. And this woman, um, Mrs., the new Mrs. De, De Winters, is living in the shadow of this, this previous wife. And the um, the main character, Mrs. Danvers, who is the head of the staff, she has all of these very uncomfortable scenes um, with Mrs. De Winters. And as the movie unfolds, it's 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 um, it stars Joan Fontaine, who plays the new Mrs. De Winters, and then Laurence Olivier, who plays Max De Winters, who you know the very cold husband who puts her in this very uncomfortable situation. And as the movie unfolds, you learn more and more of these little pieces of the puzzle as to how the first Mrs. De Winters met her demise. Do you think the dead come back and watch the living? I I don't believe it. Sometimes. I wonder if she doesn't come back here to Manderley. Watch you and Mr. De Winter together. You look tired. Why don't you stay here a while and rest? And listen to the sea. So soothing. Listen to it. Listen. Number three, John Ford. John Ford is, is pretty much the, the heart of the movie industry. He's the he's the Norman Rockwell of American cinema. Pretty much everybody I've talked about up until this point was dramatically influenced by John Ford. Akira Kurosawa, for example, his favorite director was John Ford. And when I mentioned earlier he had copied the westerns of his time, he copied John Ford's westerns. He was specifically influenced by him. Steven Spielberg, heavily influenced by John Ford. John Ford had this way of showing you the American landscape in a way that, you know, some people probably hadn't discovered yet, um, but he exposed its beauty on so many levels. But really what he was doing in his films was he was showing you the beauty of humanity. His characters, his stories, all of them were were steeped in the heart of, of you know, the American human. Steven Spielberg is famously quoted as saying that before he sits down and writes a script, and I know Spielberg doesn't write a lot of scripts, but he, he has had to multiple times. And when he does, or when he tinkers with a script, he, he says he watches one or two John Ford films just to get himself in the right mood. Stagecoach is a great example of one of the great Westerns. Uh, It was his first collaboration with John Wayne. And surprisingly, it's a film that Spielberg copied several times when he was creating Raiders of the Lost Ark. If you've seen Stagecoach, you'll know the scenes. You'll be like, oh, okay, that's the car. That's the truck chase. During World War II, John Ford stopped filming and he enlisted in the army. And he made documentary films to help um, encourage enlisting into the army for World War II and the war effort. He, uh, he worked alongside some of the generals during Midway. And many of the documentaries that you see from, that show footage from Midway are his film footage. He notably, too, from previous wars, had won 21 medals, uh, including the Purple Heart. Doc, will you tell him what you were telling me last night about how stupid he is? Yes, Doc. Maybe you'd like to tell me to my face. Yes, I would. You are stupid, Doc, and I can prove it. 
Ford won four Best Directors, which is the most of any director in the history of film. He was nominated 12 times. He won one Best Picture. And his actors, and this is, this is really one of his fortes, is he, he worked with actors and, and brought them to a level that they didn't normally reach. Uh, his actors were nominated 12 times and five of them won. And surprisingly, people don't realize this, his movies were technically musicals because he would use a musical theme and then use that to thread the theme throughout the entire film. The heart and the soul of his films always had this primal element that was very close to the heart. And as I mentioned, the songs that would go, they they would be very catchy. So you'd be caught up in the in the song that he introduced in each one of these movies. And it would go as far, too, as like the, you know, the the trumpets fit at the beginning of a battle or you know the the Native Americans with their with their um, with their drums, it it was a theme that stayed true in each individual film. private fight. The Marquis of Queensbury rules will be observed on all occasions. Now, the Marquis of Queensbury rules, mind you now, Squire. Okay with me, McAleen. <laughs> Thanks. Do you hear that, everybody? The Marquis of Queensbury rules. Now, now, the Marquis of Queensbury rules. Marquis of Queensbury rules. Uh, the Quiet Man, which is uh, stars John Wayne, uh, is one of the the rare John Ford movies. It doesn't p- take place in America. It's it's an Irish film, and you know John was originally from Ireland. His family was from Ireland, I should say. And he did touch on a couple films in that area. You know how how green was my valley, which is you know one that was the one that won Best Picture for him. But in this film, he. He shows you, and and this is the, this is his subtle comedy that he that he has. He he found a way to talk to the audience about all of the traditions that the Irish have, in a way that he, he kind of made fun of them. In, in a way, he's like these are kind of absurd, but then he embraced them at the same time too. Just the the same way he does with American traditions and, and American folklore is he would embrace it. But he would poke fun of it as he did it. And the the main theme of this film is that John Wayne goes there and he, he falls in love with Maureen O'Hara, um, you know, an Irish woman. That, and he has to go through all the trials and tribulations of courting a woman and do it in, in a way that was done in Ireland. And that's pretty much the story. Yes, Inspector. Thank you, sir. What did he say? He said to put five pounds on Dallor's nose. Another ten on cards! And then my favorite movie, which is The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. It's, it's, it's truly one of the greatest Westerns of all times. I, th- I think in my eyes it falls in the top three Westerns, you know, right behind uh, Unforgiven and um, The Treasure of the Sierra Madre. But this one is, it's told in, in the, the, um, the flashback fashion where James Stewart is this uh, senator who comes back to town to, for a funeral uh, of of this this man who's known as the man who shot Liberty Valance, and he tells the story, but it turns out the story is different than the legend that everybody remembers, and so the reporters, as they hear this story divulged to them, uh, they decide they like the legend better, but they um, they're very interested to find out what the true story was about this man. Pompey. This time, right between the eyes. 
Number two, Quentin Tarantino. Quentin is one, you know, some people might be surprised he's number two on my list, but if you were to take all of Quentin Tarantino's movies and take the very worst one, and that's, you're pushing your luck to say that there's a worst one, but everything's got, there's got to be a worst. If his worst movie was on, I would sit and watch the whole thing. They're just, every single one of them is perfect. I, I love them. Um, he just, he has a very tight uh, catalog of films. There's really only... He he says there's nine, but I, you know you count Kill Bill one, you kill you you count Kill Bill two. Hateful Eight is this film. He kind of deviates from his normal films. It's still got that classic Quentin Tarantino dialogue, but it also has this very academia style of copying some of the things that he loved so much in westerns. And it has this. There's this one opening shot at the beginning of the movie that just slowly is drawn out. And you'd swear to God it's a Sergio Leone movie, you know, the, the way he did it. Also, too, I think it's one of the, the few movies that he has a, a composer do the whole film um, in comparison to some of his other films where he just chooses some of his favorite m uh, music. Reservoir Dogs is another one where, you know, there's really not that much to it, but because his his dialogue is written so well, some of these simple scenes that are contained either within a car or within a restaurant or within an apartment or even the warehouse at the end where, you know, most most of the film takes place. It's extremely interesting and intense too. that scene where the um, where Vega cuts off the, the, the guy's ear. <laughs> Then you got Pulp Fiction. I mean, that's another one where that was the first one where he was nominated for Best Screenplay. I think he was nominated three or four times. Um, and his movies have been nominated, too. Pulp Fiction's been nominated. And Glorious Bastards has been nominated. Um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood's been nominated. So the guy's not, he's no joke. He's no slouch, we should say. And I will strike down upon thee with great vengeance and furious anger those who attempt to poison and destroy my brothers and you will know my name is the lord when i lay my vengeance upon thee some of the scenes in kill bill um and, and it goes all over the place it, it, it's it's one of those uh revenge movies mixed with western mixed with uh samurai um it it's got so many great little scenes that pay homage to his favorite stuff like this is these these are the old films the b movies that he loved and he embraced and guess what he's he's doing them in that style but he's doing them better he he everything he does that he he's heavily influenced by you know everything that came before him but he shows you how to do it. Like, here's how to really do it. Like, you know, if you love a comic book, here's the best way to do a comic. Like some of the, you know, the lower brow type pieces of art, he'll take it, he takes it and he elevates it. <laughs> and my favorite of his is Inglorious Bastards, which was it, it's one of the rare ones that almost feels like a best picture type caliber movie in comparison to some of his other ones. I mean, it's got that same uh, Quentin Tarantino dialogue to it, but it's it, it's a little bit more sophisticated. I love the opening scenes. Uh, Christopher Waltz's character is is really a great, great villain. He's one of my favorite villains. And he doesn't have to show off. There, there, there's, there's almost this very uh, quiet uh, patience to him, um, gentleness too, if you will. That's truly one of the greatest writers uh, and directors of all times, and that's why he's number two. Number one, Steven Spielberg. Honestly, did you think that anybody else would have shown up in the number one spot other than Steven Spielberg, the greatest director of all times? 
there really isn't any one thing that jumps out at me that says this is why he's the best. It, it, it's really made up of, of, of a variety of things, and all of them come from directors that we've already talked about on this list. You know, for example, Alfred Hitchcock was a, was an influence on him. You know, the technical aspect of it, the things that he used for Jaws, the 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 tension that he created in the movie Duel, or you know, all were taken from Hitchcock. David Lean uh, is said to be um, one of his favorite directors. In that um, Lawrence of Arabia, uh, I, I think I saw in, a, in an interview, Steven Spielberg mentioned that he watches Lawrence of Arabia every year, and and uh, you know. David Lean would have made the list, but he was number 11. So <laughs> if I make an 11 list, he'll be on it. Um, but there's so much that he took from, from him. Uh, Akira Kurosawa, who had a massive influence uh, on Spielberg's composition, on his uh, photography tech, technical skills, um, his, his myth and storytelling, all were a big part. And then John Ford. John Ford is his favorite director. John Ford, uh, he, he took from John Ford the heart and the soul and the humanity that he puts in films. And Spielberg is like, I can do it just as well too. And they really are probably the two directors more so than anybody that capture the essence of humanity uh, like, like no other. There, there really isn't anybody that compares to those two. He took some of the best things from all of the best directors and he did it either almost as well or as well, if not better. And that's why he's number one on this list. Then you have the actors that are in Spielberg movies. He's discovered, I don't know how many different actors, young actors. That he's worked very well with young actors, whether it was from E.T. Um, there's the scene in Jaws. You've got Empire of the Sun with Christian Bale. You have uh, A.I. He, he really knows how to get the most out of everybody. And if you see an actor and you see them in a Spielberg movie, they probably are better in a Spielberg movie than any other, under any other director that they would, you would see them on. You're going to need a bigger boat. So many iconic scenes. Uh, Sp- Spielberg didn't always write his scripts. I mean, he had a hand in, in starting them or fixing them or adding to them. Um, but there's this really great scene that was written by John Melius that's in Jaws. And that's the speech that Quint gives when talking about sharks, and he's talking about the USS Indianapolis. You know the thing about a shark? He's got lifeless eyes, black eyes, like a doll's eye. When he comes at you, he doesn't seem to be living until he bites you. And those black eyes roll over white, and then... Oh, then you hear that terrible high-pitched screaming. The ocean turns red, and... In spite of all the pounding and the hollering, they all come in and they rip you to pieces. And one of the things with Spielberg is he's done every single genre there is. Uh, you know, he's done dramas, he's done thrillers, he's done adventure, he's done comedy, he's done he's done it all, and he's done them all well. He was he's been nominated. 22 times um, for a variety of different things. He's won two best directors, one best picture, which, by the way, I think is total bullshit. He should have won a lot more. And here's the thing, too. So, like, Raiders of the Lost Ark lost to Chariots of Fire. E.T. lost to Gandhi. Uh, Saving Private Ryan uh, that, that lost to Shakespeare and Love. I mean, it's just completely not. Oh, and Jaws. All four of those movies are not only the best of that year, but they're some of the best movies ever. So it's complete nonsense that that some of those hadn't won. But but he was nominated 22 times, so not a complete disaster. Prepare to meet Kali in hell. Uh, Side note, uh, Lawrence Kasdan, who had written Raiders of the Lost Ark, uh, there's a couple of scenes in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom and my understanding was there was a lot of stuff that was in Raiders that they that didn't make it in the film and they used it in uh, Temple of Doom. And I always wondered, were some of these scenes written by Lawrence Kasdan? And, um, put down in the comments if you, if you know the answer to that question, because you know, especially some of these scenes where like they're on the plane and the, the bickering that goes back and forth between Willie and 
uh, indie. It, it's it's very reminiscent of something Lawrence Kasdan would write. So I was always curious to know if that's that was something that was on the cutting room floor of uh, Raiders and ended up in Temple of Doom, um, even though Lawrence Kasdan did not write. Are you Temple. supposed to be a lion tamer? I'm allowing you to tag along. So why don't you give your mouth a rest? Okay, doll. E.T. is one, and this uh, this gives me a chance to talk about one of the most important aspects of, of Steven Spielberg, and that's John Williams' music. John Williams' music is kind of the, the centerpiece to so many of Spielberg's movies, and, and I, I think that's one of the things that helps capture that John Fordness, that that humanity, that heart, that that American pie that, that shows up in it, and, and John Williams does that better than anybody, and... and Spielberg is so fortunate to have been able to have him utilize him in, in so many of his movies. But E.T. is a great example. And this is an interesting thing. In E.T., the, they, were, they were doing the composing and recording of, of all the music you know, lined up with the beats for the movie. And John Williams was having a little bit of trouble getting them to match up because the whole ending scene where they're cha- the cops are chasing Elliot and E.T. has all these beats, you know, over and over and over again. And they're very difficult to hit them. So what Spielberg did, which was very wise, was he looked at it and he's like, look, you know what? The music, all the little melodies that you have in there, all, all the harmonies and whatnot, they're so good. Why don't we do this? Why don't we turn off the film? You just record the music that you have set now, and then I will edit it based on the music. And this is a complete reversal of what is normally done when composing for a, a movie, you know, especially in modern times now where, where it's, it's very like um, emotionally driven to get a rise out of you here, hit this beat there. And, but instead, in this case, Spielberg knew that the music was so fantastic that he just wanted to have it and then he would edit around it and and he would put the beats that were recorded on on film to the music the musical beats and it just shows you how both you know Williams is a genius but that Spielberg knew how to uh caress this this talent this this raw just skill that that Williams had and it, it's it's a pure example of their greatness. Meet me at Omar's. Be ready for me. I'm going after that truck. Oh, I don't know. I'm making this up as I go. And then Raiders, uh, which I think is is his best film by far. It's uh, it, it, you know, it captures so many things at the same time. I, I you know, I know Lucas had a part in it. And contributed to this idea, this this pulp like old time serial character. But uh, oh, and by the way, you know, I was I was watching uh, this movie. It was um, the greatest show on earth, which was one of Spielberg's favorites. And the character, the main character in it, Charlton Hester's character, it occurred to me at one point. I'm like, he's wearing the exact outfit of Indiana Jones. I'm like, that's pretty much where wardrobe got it with with the idea so i mean george lucas might have had an idea of what indiana jones was going to look like but i'm sure spielberg came along as like he's going to look like this this is the way he's going to look <laughs> Son of a bitch. um but the elements that he put in there there was so much he, the, there there's a lot to be said for the transition from thriller and drama to adventure and it was really just the right time for Spielberg in his career to go, you know what, we're going full on adventure because he allowed the tension and the suspense to apply to his adventure scenes to make them as great as they were. That's why Steven Spielberg is number one on this list. I want to thank you for watching. I'm Fox Sellers. And if you have a different top 10 that deviates from mine, please uh, put it in the notes. Let me know. But if you liked this, enjoyed this, uh, please click like, subscribe, and you can continue to see and hear more other videos from me. Thanks.